me. Okay, I've had three children, so I normally do this without a microphone. I'm just good at shouting, so I try not to shout at the same time. Um, so it gives me great pleasure to actually be here talking to you about victims um, working for circles. I'm going to start off with a cautionary note to start with, that I don't like the term victim. I'm not sure which term I like best, but I'm going to use the term survivor, because actually if they're volunteering, they're really no longer victims. And I know that lots of people get very offended by the difference of usage of language. Um, and I think Liz Kelly comes up with the phrase of people who have experienced sexual violence, but that is too much of a mouthful in this environment, so I'm going to go with survivor. So I've got a journey I want to take you on, and I'm hoping I'm short enough that you can still see above me. Um, it's a journey that I think it will be an enjoyable one, but it might be a bit of an eye-opener and a bit tough going here and there. I'm going to get us to contemplate... Um, the context of survivorship, uh, particularly in relation to sexual violence. I'm, gonna, I'm really critical of the clinical views of surviving sexual violence, and I'm going to contrast that with the positive psychology or the positive victimology of survivorhood. I don't want to focus on all weaknesses and vulnerability. I also want to talk about strength and resilience. In particular, I want to take a, a salugenic approach, so looking particularly at things like post-traumatic growth and altruism born of suffering. I then progress into volunteerism, and particularly volunteerism in the aftermath of experiencing sexual violence. So not looking at doing volunteering to build your CV, which is what a lot of my students seem to be doing nowadays. I've, I'm always a bit disillusioned because I thought they should be doing it for altruistic motives, but many, many of them are doing it just for CV building. So we're going to look at it in a different context. And then I'm going to get, sort of explore with you the idea of um, survivors working as volunteers for circles and introducing you to, to some of the work that Chris Wilson and I have been doing in, in putting our toe in the water and testing the temperature of what the views are around that and then the plans for some, a research study that we're planning to sort of get going very shortly. So what do we know about victims of um, sexual abuse or sexual violence? When I talk about abuse, I'm normally talking about childhood sexual abuse. When I talk about assault, I'm normally thinking in terms of adult sexual assault. And I want you to think for a minute or two about the two lists I'm going to present to you and see what they suggest to you about survivors. So if we think about the long-term effects of child sexual abuse... What we find is the research literature tells us that they are at much greater risk of having depression and anxiety, self-harming, suicidal ideation or thinking of suicide and actually attempted suicide. They have higher levels of psychoticism and hostility. They have a fear and avoidance of dentists, which doesn't sound too much of a problem, but actually that, that promotes really high-risk health behaviours, high risk for heart disease if you don't have good dental hygiene. Marital dissatisfaction, sexual dissatisfaction, high risk for um, being a victim of domestic violence, high use of substance misuse, um, the intergenerational transmission of violence, the progression from being a victim becoming a perpetrator, high levels of eating disorders, a downward social spiral which was identified by Russell back in the 1980s. So despite having quite good educational attainment, uh, many survivors will actually experience going down the social hierarchy and ending up in poverty and trapped in poverty in the end. Homelessness and um, high risk of experiencing a custodial sentence or being a psychiatric inpatient. So that's uh, victims of child sexual abuse. If we then think about the uh, adult survivors of sexual assault, Associated conditions are phobias and obsessive compulsive disorders, things like agoraphobia, relationship and marital difficulties, again reliance on medication whether it's legal or illegal, avoidance of the crime of the scene, intrusive thoughts and images, sexual and relationship difficulties, fear of sex, fear of men and global fears, fears specific to the rape situation, mood swings, anger, depression, and re-experiencing um, the, the actual assault itself, usually triggered by sights, sounds, and smells, quite impulsive behavior, and nightmares. So we have these two lists. 
what image do they conjure up for us? Somebody shout out something. <laughs> Is it a positive image that we're seeing? It's a high one of pathology, vulnerability, and, and that to me is quite worrying. And I did a little search of the literature just by typing in surviving sexual violence or victims of sexual violence, and everything that you get up generally is something that's quite negative. Now, importantly, not everybody experiences these effects. Not everybody who experiences childhood sexual abuse will experience those. And in fact, 50% of survivors don't experience any long-term psychiatric or psychological distress. So it means only half of people are going to experience it. Also, in terms of rape, a lot of the conditions that we saw were really sort of different symptoms to do with post-traumatic stress disorder. And actually, 40% of survivors of adult sexual assault don't develop symptoms of rape trauma syndrome or PTSD. So actually, this doesn't relate to all victims, even though all victims or all survivors tend to get um, judged in the same way. There are a number of moderators of the harm that, that people experience. So in the context of child sexual abuse, then, there are a number of protective factors. Children that manage to carry on engaging well in school and actually enjoy education or achieve well, um, seem to be protected. Just having one supportive caregiver. They don't have to be a great parent, but it's just somebody that is there to support them. Also having a positive adult role model. That could be a teacher, that could be a friend's parent, or an older sibling, uh, or a grandparent. In terms of risk factors that make it much more likely that there's going to be a negative response, are things to do with if it's an intrafamilial um, abuser, with it in the context of the family, if the abuse started at a very early age, if there were multiple perpetrators, and that's quite likely, because as soon as a child is victimised by one perpetrator, they're much more likely to be victimised again and again by different perpetrators throughout the lifespan. Also, the severity and the duration of abuse, so how long it's gone on for and how frequently. The most important one, and the one that can override everything else, is the reaction they get to a disclosure of childhood sexual abuse. Often, the disclosures are not met with a positive outcome. A positive outcome is somebody that believes them, doesn't blame them, and gives them an opportunity to talk about it. The one thing that we do as adults when something bad has happened to a child is we tell them never to think about it again. And so we don't mention it again because we think by not talking about it, it disappears. It really doesn't. Actually, by having, it doesn't have to be a great response, but just somebody that allows them to talk about it and believes them can actually undo most of the harm that's done. So actually, the disclosure process is the important one. The moderating factors in adult sexual assault, then, are not too dissimilar. But whether or not somebody's got a prior history of psychological problems, so if they've had depression or anxiety in the past, that may make matters worse for them. If they have a prior history of victimisation, that also is quite problematic. The severity of violence that they've experienced, weirdly, for in some studies they suggest that the more severe and lethal the violence was, or near lethal the violence was, the worse it is. Others actually say, actually it's the ambiguity around the assault and that the lack of the lethal violence that actually leaves the person very, very distressed because they don't label their experience of sexual assault for a very long time and it's a non-labeling bit that's problematic. So it could be the degree of perceived danger that the person thought they're in. Now many people would see, hear of a rape and not imagine the person thought they were going to die. Many survivors of rape actually sort of say be, in the offence they believed that they were going to die, even though that was never the perpetrator's intention, but it is their belief. The severity of the injuries that they sustained. There's some argument that actually um, older people experience worse psychological ex um, effects following sexual assault. Other studies suggest it's when you're younger and you're in your fertile years that the effects are worse. And we haven't quite resolved that issue at the moment. Recovery is also far worse for people that are experiencing poverty or discrimination or oppression within society, mainly because they haven't got other resources around them to help them to support moving on. Those who engage in high levels of self-blame find it much harder to move on. 
and rape that's happened in a, a location that was pre previously considered to be a very safe environment is particularly problematic. One of my PhD students some years ago studied surviving rape um, and she interviewed 24 survivors. And one of the key things that she found was, was those people that were raped abroad because they were either volunteering abroad or happened to be on holiday when they were, they were assaulted actually recovered much quicker because when they returned home there were no reminders of the incident. Um, and there's also a high, uh, high chance of people that once they've been raped will move house very quickly. About 50% of people who experience a sexual assault will move to get out of the area. Um, Again, very much like the children, one of the key predictors of whether somebody will experience psychological distress following the assault is the response they had to a disclosure. So the first person to whom they told and how they behaved. Again, it's issues to do with being believed and not being blamed. Um, you would, most of you would not have heard of Ken Clark. He's not my favourite person. He was a politician in the UK who, a number of years ago, it must be sort of more than three years ago, he, he said something that came over on the radio that actually a sexual assault by a known perpetrator or an acquaintance really wasn't, a, wasn't as serious as one by a stranger. I nearly crashed my car driving over a roundabout when I heard this on the radio because I thought, well, actually, I would imagine a sexual assault by a known person is far worse because it's a betrayal of your, the trust and relationship you've built up. A stranger we don't expect to care for us too much, but somebody we know we would expect to. Importantly, the nature of the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator does not have a moderating effect on the psychological outcomes for the survivor. So, what we're saying is, is actually people cope in different ways um, and it depends on their experiences and the other support that's around them. I have put the word here, healing, in inverted commas, um, because I'm not sure that I like the word healing, because healing sounds like you have an illness that you've got to sort of get over and be made better from. And actually, to use the word healing actually negates the fact that actually some people are incredibly resilient in the face of adversity. And if you're resilient, you're not harmed in the first place. So part of me prefers the term moving on, or restoring the self, but most of the literature talks about healing, so I'm going to go with healing for a moment. So Judith Herman's work looks at this really in detail, and I think she does an amazing job of this, and she talks not just of healing from psychological trauma, but also the justice needs of victims, because I actually think that actually it's the justice needs that most victims need to be fulfilled in order to become um, a survivor. So in terms of our justice needs as survivors, then you'd need to receive a vindication, which has been not being blamed. Um, and as I said earlier, we tend to like to blame victims when something's happened to them. They should also receive validation, so being believed, particularly to, by those to whom they disclose. Usually they're disclosing in order to create a sense of safety for themselves and for other people. So most people's motivation for going to the police in relation to a sexual assault or child sexual abuse is actually to protect future victims. The same goal, really, as Circles has. They want to regain also a sense of personal control because the key thing that's been taken away from them is their control. Their wishes have not been recognised in anything that's happened to them. They also want the opportunity to tell their story and to have it heard without any judgement. And the final one is they want to find meaning for their victimisation. Now, in Judith Herman's paper, she does a really nice um, account where she tries to map on the victim's experience of going through the criminal justice system, as it stands in the UK, the adverse, uh, adversarial criminal justice system, and looking at these justice needs. And she said, actually, the way things are at the moment, not one of these needs are met. In fact, we do the opposite to fulfilling any of these needs. Um, which is a bit sad, really. So if we think about the attitudes then towards survivors of sexual violence, some would actually say that the stigma of being a victim of sexual abuse or sexual assault is almost as great as that as being a perpetrator. Many people will be completely ousted out. And if you think cross-culturally, um, in some cultures, actually, women who have been, been raped are expected to commit suicide, can be stoned to death. We are really, it's not a good group to be in. 
It's also an identity that many people feel that they have to keep secret, uh, particularly from the wider community, even though they may feel to comp compelled to tell others, particularly their intimate partners. However, actually disclosing their survivor status can actually lead to very negative outcomes to them, even when they're disclosing to those who are nearest and dearest and who they believe they can trust. And there's a quite recent paper now by um, Del Castillo and O'Doherty, which actually makes for very sad reading. Um, and it's not unlike some of the work that I've found where pe when people have disclosed, they've been treated very differently by their partner, have been sexually assaulted by that partner, or they've then engaged in physical violence towards them. They've often treated them as though they're now dirty or damaged in some way. So even though the relationship may have been going on for some time. I think the other key thing for me really is that survivors' voices are often discredited either through the disbelief of their claims of victimisation, and if we think in terms of allegations of rape, when we look at um, studies looking at police attitudes towards complainants of rape, actually between a half and two-thirds are believed to not be genuine claims. And I did a calculation about a month ago and worked out that if you're a complainant reporting a, a rape to the police in the UK, and the police didn't believe you, you had four chance, times more likelihood of being convicted of making a false allegation of rape than um, a sex offender who the police believed had committed the offence had of gaining the conviction for the offence he had committed. Um, so that to me means you're really discredited as a victim. The other part of it is, is just not just the disbelief, it's the fact that because of all the other studies that suggest that you have some form of pathology following victimisation, that anything that you say from now on is, is just a load of nonsense and it shouldn't be believed. And actually the status then of survivors really is diminished. So why do we have such biased views against victims? Um, we have far more biased views against victims of sexual violence than we do of any other crime. And that to me is quite scary. One of the explanations is the prevalence and persistence of rape myths and child sexual abuse myths that we have um, within our societies. So rape myths would be things like, you can't rape a woman against her will, if she doesn't want sex you'll keep her legs shut, women fantasise about rape, women claim rape all the time just to get revenge on somebody and all of these things serve to discredit so the myths will actually serve to either say no real harm was done or that you should blame the victim so good girls can't be raped and she shouldn't have been dressed like that or walking in that alley at that time so she is to blame or they're to do with the fact you can't believe them there are also specific um, myths around male rape and similar things around child abuse. They are so prevalent in the public mind. And I do a lot of research on this. And one of the key things that people say to me afterwards is, I know I shouldn't say this, but... And it's always, they shouldn't have been where they were, they shouldn't have been dressed how they were. As human beings, we also have a really key um, need for a belief in a just world. We want to believe that we live in a fair world, where if we're good and that we obey the social order, that we'll be safe and that good things will happen to us. If we're bad, then only bad things should happen. So if something bad happens to somebody, they've had to in some way have actually deserved that. So if I was to trip over this bit here now, I'm not going to point this out really. If I was to trip over this, you'd all say, God, she's damn right clumsy. I would say, Actually, I'm very, very skilled, and I noticed that, but somebody else left that there. I would blame somebody else. You would blame me as an individual. We all do this in terms of our attribution theories. It's known as fundamental attribution error. So if I was to do something good, I would definitely think it was me that did it. I wouldn't think it was you that were, helped me in any way. Um, whereas if I did something bad, it was definitely your fault, not my fault. However, we also have what's known as defensive attribution theory, and that means if, if I think, what, so I'm going to pick on you because you're looking lovely and smiling at me. Um, so if you, did, <laughs> if you did something barking mad and just hurt yourself falling down those steps, because I think, well, I've got a pair of high heel shoes on as well and I might fall down there, I'm not going to blame you as much as the gentleman here who's wearing nice, sensible shoes. So he's going to say it was definitely your fault, your fault you're, you're daft, and I'm going to give him, well, I think it's those steps, because I'm, I might experience it later and I don't want anybody to blame me later on if it happens. 
We also have such a taboo about talking about sex and sexual abuse, and there is this really imposed secrecy around it. Um, my daughter and I have been interviewing young men, running focus groups, talking about consent for sex in my old institution where I used to work. We always do it late at night, mainly because I've got to drive 50 miles to get there after work. And the last time we did one, my daughter took the young men upstairs that had arrived, and I was waiting down in the reception for the others to arrive. And there was a, a lorry delivering a load of stuff, and the two blokes that were doing the removal, moving all the stuff out, came up to me and said, is it true you're talking about sex upstairs? And I said, yes. <laughs> but actually, I'm talking about consent for sex, not sex itself. And they, they were so overwhelmed, they wanted to come and join us. Um, and actually... <laughs> The young men that have taken part in the focus groups make us stay for an hour and a half afterwards having a debrief. And they're so fascinated by it. And we don't talk, you know, sensationalistically about sex. It's really about relationships and respectful relationships. But they say, nobody's ever sat us down and talked like this um, with us ever before. Because we have such a taboo around it. Um, and last year I was teaching in a lecture theatre like this with 200 young people in it. And I said to them, how many of you learnt about sex from your parents teaching you about it? And two people stuck their hand up, and then they looked very, very embarrassed. And I thought, yes, we don't even talk about it with those we should be. So let and that's on it, when it's a good thing, let alone when it's something that's about harm, we certainly don't want to talk about it. For a while where I teach, I was putting an engineering and um, computing department. Not the ideal place for me, you can imagine, with my research topic. And I remember sort of thinking, every time I had to do a conference there, the guys would want me to get off the stage as quickly as possible, because you just don't talk about sexual violence. You can talk about engineering structures of bridges, but not sexual violence. I also feel that we've got this negative view of um, victims has inadvertently come from the pressure groups that have actually been out there working to serve the rights and needs of victims. And I think they haven't meant to do what they've done, but inadvertently they have raised the profile by saying, look how much damage is done to these people. We need these services. You know, we need to fight for rights. And in doing so, it means it's fueled the public mind of these people are very vulnerable, weak and damaged. I also think that, I mean, I'm a psychologist and I like to blame psychology for all sorts of things. Um, I'd like to think of myself really as pretending to be a sociologist dressed in a psychology suit. But actually, when you look at most psychology, it looks at the negative. It's only recent years we've started to look at positive psychology, positive victimology, positive criminology. We've always looked at the doom and gloom. And so, you know, finding positive things in anything is quite hard. And I think that's part of the problem. I do think part of that is understandable, though. Um, I did come across a paper some years ago um, on the positive effects of experiencing child sexual abuse. And I remember that there was a PhD done in Glasgow University in 2005 that has not been released from the university and it's not allowed out of the university. And I don't know quite how it's got ethics. But the person that did the study actually posed as a boy lover on the internet and then made contact with um, paedophiles who gave him the contact details of their victims who he then went and interviewed about the, the positive benefits of the relationship they had uh, with the paedophile. Not an ideal type of study. There's also the meta-analysis done by Rind and colleagues a while ago that said that there was no ill effect from child sexual abuse. It became one of the, the most cited studies because everybody was so outraged. What they'd failed to say is all of the studies they included in this had all been conducted on um, undergraduate students. There were pen and paper um, surveys of people that were in university on that day feeling well. So obviously it said there was no ill effects. So I think people have been very reticent to actually sort of say, actually survivors do okay, or some survivors do okay under certain circumstances. And I think we're quite scared of saying that in case we undo all the work that others have done fighting for the rights and needs of survivors. However, if we do want to adopt a more salutogenic, uh, salutogenic approach then to understanding survivorhood, what do we need to do? And I quite like this idea of weeds will just grow absolutely anywhere. It doesn't matter how much tarmac you put down. I'm really interested in this idea that you don't just become a survivor, but many people will move on to become absolute thrivers. So looking particularly at post-traumatic growth. 
So some people do seem to demonstrate this profound resilience in the face of adversity. And as I said earlier, resilience means that you didn't actually experience any ill effect of what happened. It might be because you were so um, high in self-esteem, had good support networks around you, you didn't really need to fall apart. And it reminds me of when I used to do work for victim support. And an elderly lady who was 84 experienced a robbery. She was wheelchair bound, she was an amputee and had one leg removed. And the young burglar had decided whilst he was burgling the house and found her that he would rape her. So we all thought, my God, this poor, poor lady, she's really going to need loads of support. So we rushed around there and uh, she just said, look, I've been through two world wars, I've had my leg cut off, I know I've been married, divorced and I've brought up four kids. This little bugger is not going to screw up my life. And for her, she was resilient. It wasn't going to have the impact on her. I also think that uh, resilience is a bit minimalistic. It just gets you back to baseline. And I don't think anybody ever gets back to baseline after sexual abuse or sexual assault. And with child sexual abuse, where would you have been anyway? Because you've got no idea what trajectory you'd have taken. So I think that's quite a tough one to talk about. I think the key thing about many survivors is actually the exceptional selflessness that many individuals engage in, in their actions post-abuse, some time after the abuse or the assault. So I think the concept of post-traumatic growth is a really interesting one. So Tadeshi and Calhoun are the people that really came up with this. And they suggest that the experience of distress caused by trauma may not only be associated with negative outcomes, but could also um, lead to the survivor resolving their distress and leading them to growth and to do things that they would never have done previously. Now my PhD student that um, studied rape, she herself was a survivor who was in her 50s was um, attacked by a serial rapist and was left for dead by him. It was a strange rapist who was never caught, although the police had tied up that there was eight similar um, offences. And she formed a support group with the other victims. And uh, she realised that out of the consequence of her rape, she came to university, became my undergraduate student studying criminology and psychology, and from that moved into doing her PhD, and then now does restorative justice and uh, victim support for, for rape uh, survivors. She said but some of the other survivors weren't survivors. They'd lost their jobs, they lost their marriage, they lost their home. They became very depressed, they didn't go out. And she said, what was it about her that had made her change her life trajectory? Prior to coming to university, she'd stacked shelves in Waitrose, and suddenly her life had taken on a whole new meaning, and she wanted to explore that. So it was a real movement beyond her pre-trauma level of functioning. So despite what had happened, she'd moved in a really, what she felt was a very positive direction. And Tadeshi and Calhoun actually report that 50% of survivors of trauma identified the traumatic event as being the catalyst for this personal adaptation and positive change in their life. Now, originally, we thought that actually um, survivors of child sexual abuse couldn't experience post-traumatic growth. So Jessie said reasons this might be was that children actually lacked this mental capacity for organising their world, and they didn't yet have a sense of personal identity. So that sense of identity couldn't be shattered in the same way as we do with um, adults. They also suggested it was because children tended to blame themselves much more than adult survivors. However, my PhD student's work said actually the adult survivors in her study, those engaged in the most self-blame, were the ones most likely to experience post-traumatic growth and to evidence that in their actions. They also suggested it was the process of finding meaning in the event and the amelioration or the ending of the emotional distress that led to positive adaptation. And for many survivors of childhood sexual abuse, that might not happen until later on, and maybe early adulthood or middle adulthood before that happens. So I actually argue that, um, that adult survivors of child sexual abuse do have potential for post-traumatic growth, um, and it may take longer than it would for adult survivors, but they do get there in the end if that's the trajectory that they're going to take. So in terms of looking at the studies on post-traumatic growth, there seems to be three cognitive domains in which growth might be experienced. It might be in somebody's perception of themselves, so their, their own perception of their own strengths might change. The way in which they conceive their relationships to others, so relationships to others might suddenly take on a much greater importance. 
They may also realise that uh, some relationships are quite dangerous and remove themselves from them. And also about their ph philosophy of life. So what are the core interests in life and the things that should be held in high regard? So it doesn't seem to be depend that much on the nature of the event itself that caused the trauma, but rather how the events are actually appraised. The key things to experience post-traumatic growth are this perception of a threat to a life, there has to be this existential struggle with the surrounding events and trying to work out meaning from it all. And then uh, you need to be able to actually create meaning out of something that appears to everybody else as being very meaningless. The key things to me, which is leading us into the volunteerism, is for post-traumatic growth, is the compassion and altruism that runs alongside it. So people don't tend to experience post-traumatic growth in terms of personal striving for personal goals that are just for them. It's usually about for other people. So Deshi and colleagues actually said when people recognise their own vulnerability, they may be better able to feel compassion and that it serves as some kind of empathy training. So out of this, they may come, uh, come the need to help but this is likely to occur after some time has passed and people have actually found their meaning. So in terms of post-traumatic growth and well-being, I remember going to a conference some years ago and originally they were saying, actually, the higher the level of post-traumatic stress disorder somebody experienced, the higher the probability they had for post-traumatic growth. That research then became muddied as new research came in and the relationship didn't be, seem to be that consistent. But some research now that looks specifically at post-traumatic growth, post growth in the context of sexual violence indeed suggests that the higher levels of PTSD are associated with higher levels of post-traumatic growth. There are key symptoms that seem to be associated with the likelihood of experiencing growth. So it's not so much the intrusive thoughts uh, that, that lead to growth, things that are quite um, passive, that happen to you, unex you know, unexpectedly and out of your control. Things like nightmares and flashbacks are out of your control and tend not to be associated with post-traumatic growth. Whereas things like um, avoidance of particular situations and hyperarousal seem to go alongside. And it's almost as though they, they're the um, key um, symptoms that lead into action and people actually work on those and become very active, even active in avoidance. Obviously, as with any concept within research, there's a problem with viable research methods and operational definitions. When Cynthia did her own research, we looked at Tadeshi and Calhoun's scale for measuring post-traumatic growth, because we were going to use it, and then we realised you could either have growth or no growth, but you couldn't actually have a loss in something, and that's quite problematic, because people are normally experiencing losses. There are also different ways in which we conceptualise it. Some people say that growth is your outcome. It's a thing that you're going to, you know, it's an end goal. And once you get there, that's it. I think what we found from Cynthia's work is actually post-traumatic growth is a process. It's ongoing. It's never-ending. So Steve Hodfell actually suggests that um, genuine growth only occurs when cognitive changes are actually transformed into action. So it can't be you just got a change in your thoughts. You have to have a change in your behaviour and what you're doing. Storb also argues that action uh, may actually prefer, pr promote further change as individuals learn by doing more, and so the growth accumulates over time. I think this is the important part for me, is, is the growth isn't just for that individual, and it's not just about their volunteering, but actually the actions of survivors of violence can actually operate as a catalyst for social transformation through the enlightenment of others and the commitment of securing justice and the prevention of similar events. So the key thing is that they, would, they will be doing and working with others. All of Cynthia's 24 participants, all of them were working with stigmatised groups, either as volunteers or they'd gone to get jobs working with different groups of people. They weren't always working with survivors of sexual violence, but it was always a stigmatised group. So it might be the um, survivor's own process of post-traumatic growth that is the impetus for providing and seeking social change. So something will be working to actually get political change going and not just supporting and ameliorating problems at hand. One of the newer concepts that have come out was really altruism born of suffering. 
And this is specific to do with victims of physical and sexual violence. And this is where they can actually develop a real commitment to preventing further suffering, or as Lifton would call it, the survivor mission. And this may make uh, more sense in relation to survivors becoming volunteers. It differs from both resilience and post-traumatic growth in three, different way, in three key ways. It focuses on the trauma of interpersonal victimisation rather than any other form of trauma. It really focuses on preventing further violence, as in working for circles. And it's about the generation of positive change that facilitates helpful action. Again, I've put healing in inverted commas. So healing for trauma, then, is really essential for people that are going to actually develop um, altruism born out of suffering. So Storb and Perlman suggest there's three ways in which we can get healing, and I think this is quite an important factor for when you're thinking about your selection process for volunteers. I often hear people say about once, once the survivors resolve their issues or once they've been into therapy, then it's okay for them to do something. Therapy is not the only way of moving on following sexual violence. It could be therapy or creative writing. It could just be finding social support or significant human connections. So that might just be peer support groups or forums might be the thing that works for people. For other people, it's just learning about the causes and consequences of violence and intellectualisation. So they want to know more about it, to understand, to do meaning for themselves. They don't necessarily need to have therapy. So in terms of healing according to them, then, we need the basic fulfilment of psychological needs. We have to have, back to like Herman's work, security, a belief in our ability to influence events and basically have control, to have a sense of autonomy and choice, to have a sense of connection to others, and a comprehension of reality and place in the world for the individual. Once we have all of these, we actually get our need for transcendence emerges. And this enables us to focus on issues beyond oneself, which allows for altruistic actions. Whilst people are going through maybe the healing process, they haven't got time to think about others necessarily at the very start, but once they're getting going, they can think about others. So the key thing about altruism and the change in orientation of the self and others then, is there are two types of change that might actually arise as a consequence of victimisation. We might come to see other individuals in quite a favourable light and show concern for their well-being, irrespective of what they've done. They also start to consider themselves strong enough to shift attention of care away from themselves to start focusing on other people. There's also an increase in perspective taking and hence empathy. Um, Kleinman suggests the reason why people want to go into helping others is to reduce survivor guilt and to provide a new meaning for life. I'm not too sure whether I like that one. But when I think about this, I think about there's one of my students this year studied um, youth justice panels with young offenders. So I'm off the topic momentarily of sexual violence. She works on the panels but decided to interview all the young people about their experience and about the reparation that they were made to engage in. Most of the young people she interviewed were asked to do um, cleaning graffiti off of walls and um, subways or litter picking off local parks. But a number of them were made to go and work in a soup kitchen for the homeless of the community. And the guys that went to work with the homeless in the soup kitchen actually felt this real commitment in the end to this group of people. And they sort of said that served as a catalyst for change for them. Because they suddenly realised that other people were worse off than them, but also that they were valued enough to be given responsibility for caring for other people. And the ability to give back was actually very influ influential in their change. Now, many of the young people she'd been working with were people that had been harmed in some way by others. So although they were offenders, they were also victims. So moving on to volunteerism then. So survivors actually helping others. So Penna um, says there's four key attributes of volunteerism which serve to define it and distinguish it from other forms of pro-social behaviour, particularly things like bystander intervention. So I don't know if you know, I went to see... Um, who's heard of Zimbardo in the audience? Anybody heard of... It? Well, just one, two, three, a few of you. I went to meet him when he first wrote his book, The Lucifer Effect, and he came over to London. And he was saying about an incident that just happened in America at the time. And he said he, on a tube station, some of you might have heard of this on the news, there were 70 people at a tube station and a young guy 
had a heart attack and collapsed on the rails. Nobody knew he had a heart attack, but a young guy suddenly falls, I think it was like something like seven feet, onto railway tracks, unconscious. 70 people stand there doing nothing, absolutely nothing. And then some, it was, happened to be a white guy, some black guy who looks like a gangland rapper with his two young daughters comes down the steps into the subway, sees the guy on the rails and the tube heading towards him. So he gives his two children to somebody who says, just look after my kids. And he jumps down and lays over the young man who's starting to come around. And so he has to sort of move all his limbs and just says to him, just trust me. And apparently there was a half an inch between the two bodies on top of one another, between the, the, their heads and the train as it went over the top of them. So why would he want to be the person that didn't just stand by and watch? Why, why was he different? That's what we normally class as bystander intervention. Bystander intervention is different from volunteerism. It's a momentary thing. You haven't thought about it. You do it spontaneously. You hope to never repeat that again in your life because you'd be too scared to next time. Volunteerism is different. It's planned action. You really consider whether or not you want to engage in it, whether or not it's right for you. So it's a decision really to make quite a long commitment to something. You're also not obliged to help. It's not a case of you then that you'd feel guilty if you didn't do it because there's nothing there that you're witnessing when you're doing volunteering. It's something that's happening out there and you can turn a blind eye if you want to. You don't have to do it. Whereas when it's happening in front of you, you feel obliged. The other key thing with um, volunteerism is it occurs within an organisational context with a support network around you, with training available, actually to build skills around that. So there's very different things. So when we're thinking about pro-social behaviour, thinking about volunteering is very different from the rest. Interestingly, volunteerism is much more common. You'd think that we'd want to act on spur of the moment with less um, time commitment to things, but actually we, we like the time commitment. Um, and it seems to be a much more important form of pro-social action than bystander intervention. And interestingly, it was quite interesting yesterday hearing about, I think it was Latvia that doesn't have um, a, a norm for volunteering. I think the UK seems to be one of the leading industrialised uh, countries that, that do, does do volunteering. So 48% of the population who are aged over 18 actually do do volunteering, in, com in contrast to only 25% of that same age group in uh, Japan. So why do um, people actually become a volunteer? So I'm going to touch on what Stephen did earlier this morning. The people that seem to want to do it the most seem to be those who are educated, um, have relative wealth, that way they're free to actually take off some time to go and do it. And usually younger people want to do it for CVs, older people are doing it as a way of giving something back to society usually. I've missed out gender. Gender, it tends to be a gender attribute anyway. So the fact that we're having more female volunteers in circles also doesn't surprise me. There's also personal attributes. So some people have a much greater predisposition for being more pro-social, feel obliged to help more than others. Other people might feel a bit of social pressure. I think I've done this with my students in circles on a number of occasions. I think when I've dragged Dom in, you know, a bit of social pressure, get in there to come and do some volunteering, make them feel guilty if they don't. And there's other volunteer activators, and these could be personal life events. If somebody's personally experienced something, or they know somebody in their family that's been exposed in some way, or they've just been made aware of what's going on. So all of these things could actually evoke things like a sense of shame, concern and sympathy and approach behaviours. And one of the things we noted with Cynthia's work is it did seem to be people that had really high levels of blame and shame that seemed to want to do much more helping other people. So the other motivators for volunteering then, some people just have humanitarian concerns uh, for looking after their community and helping others. As I said, some people are just doing it to gain... Um, things on their CV, it might link into their career interests. I always say to my students, give it a go because you'll know whether or not you want to do this as a full-time job. Don't wait until you get to the job to find out you don't like it. It could be to make new friends. I've got to say, I've just, I've just volunteered to go and clean out the local river full of all the debris because I just thought that's a nice way of making friends. And I start next week, so that should keep me busy. It could be a protective thing about avoiding um, feeling guilty for being very egocentric. And it could be a real it's enhancement for personal growth, generally. The other theoretical explanations for volunteering, then, we're back to just wealth theory. 
So actually, by, if we respond to violations of others, actually in a manner that restores fairness, we again think that we're living in a much more fair world. Greenberg and colleagues suggest it's actually terror management, the fact that we all actually feel very, very vulnerable and that we fear death, and therefore we engage in all these actions to try and quell our own anxieties. Now, you'd think that if somebody's actually experienced some form of personal trauma, then there is a high risk of experiencing re-traumatisation if they were to work in an organisation such as Circles as a volunteer. We should also be worried about people that have never experienced or had any awareness about sexual violence because they're at risk of vicarious traumatisation. To have not known about something before and then to suddenly find it is a shattering of self. Um, whereas a victim or a survivor of sexual violence who already understands about it that comes into circles, there's no shattering of self again. It's not quite as bad. So vi vicarious traumatisation impacts on those that had no prior knowledge or experience of the thing. And we tend to not focus on that as much as we do as re-traumatisation. Although from the work that I've done in the past, it looks like vicarious traumatisation is a worse impact where people are so shattered by something. There's no undoing the shattering. Once you realise that something bad is out there, you can no longer take that away, unfortunately. But with re-traumatisation, we obviously worry about those that are working in the environment that have experienced this phenomenon for themselves. And it can cause a re-traumatisation when it, when it resonates with their own life experience or it might reawaken their traumatic experiences that they had. Now, many people will say it's going to bring up their memories of the past. I can tell you now that most survivors say their memories are never far from the surface. They do not go away, you know, and sometimes actually having an opportunity that arises that allows them to talk about it again in a constructive way is actually quite comforting. Or as some of my participants have said, actually being given an opportunity to cry on occasions when their emotions are really strong isn't a negative thing, it's actually quite a positive thing. Now, Atherton looks at a concept called supplantive learning, and I looked at this a number of years ago because, weirdly, a lot of my students study things that are personally significant for their dissertations and their PhDs. They'll study things like sexual violence, um, somebody did uh, co-victims of homicide having her br brother been murdered a little while ago, and so they normally do things that are um, quite close to home. Now, that can be quite problematic for them in as much as they'll have to confront information that they don't particularly like or it doesn't fit with the way that they think about the world. Um, and that can be quite hard to do. But you can support people through that and actually warn them that that's likely to happen. Now, actually, the risk for re-traumatisation, though, can be exacerbated for those people who are actually driven to help others but who encounter a perceived failure or an obstacle to, to success. So it could be for a survivor working in circles whose who's offender or core member gets recalled back to prison they, or actually offends, they might find it harder uh, and it's just to be aware of that. Not only are there people that know that they're survivors that might be drawn to particular types of work, but people can be drawn into certain fields of work without actually recognising their own previous victimisation. Um, and this has happened to quite a number of people that have either worked in child protection services or as researchers on projects to do with sexual violence, that it's only during the course of their work that they suddenly discover that they themselves have actually experienced this. Um, I, one of the things I look at in my own research is the concept of um, amnesia for memories of abuse. And I know it's quite a dodgy concept and lots of people don't like it. But actually about a third of people that are abused within the family have no uh, conscious recollection of their abuse until sometimes later. And the average age of remembering is about 30. And I've just had um, somebody that I knew from years ago who knew that she'd been abused, was having flashbacks in her sleep but had no conscious awareness. Um, and was, was suffering a lot because of not knowing, but it was all at police records, it had all gone to court, but had no memory. And unfortunately, um, just a couple of years ago, she had her first baby, and during her labour, the whole thing um, came back to her. Um, but on the coming back, she now feels stronger, and it's all started to make sense, which is a, a quite a tough one. But it means that you could have people that are working as volunteers who wouldn't identify themselves as survivors because they don't yet know that. But that wouldn't stop them having this pull to work in a particular environment. 
So Hilton and colleagues actually did a survey of clinicians working with sex offenders and actually found that 37% of females and 27% of the men that were working in that environment actually had a history of child sexual abuse. So they're the ones that remembered. That's a far higher rate than we'd expect survivors to be in the general population. Importantly, some reported positive effects of working with this uh, group. They came to recognise their own child sexual abuse as being quite common and that they were no longer isolated. They gained insight into the perpetrator's behaviours and they actually stopped blaming themselves for what went on. This was me this morning doing my exercise, but my daughter's changed gender, but never mind. Some bloke in the corridor. Um, the key thing with anybody that's working in this type of environment is, is to have this ethic of self-care. And um, this can really protect against re-traumatisation. So part of it is keeping a bit of humour going in your life. Um, so three important factors. The first one is self-awareness. And as I just mentioned, for some, this actually might not be there. They might be amnesic or they might not have yet labelled their experience as abuse. And actually... It's about, another, I've said about a third of people will, will not remember their abuse until older and another third of people won't label their experience as abuse or an assault until a later date. You'd think that actually by not labelling it means it couldn't have been that bad. Actually when we look at the long term outcomes of not labelling, actually far worse outcomes for those that don't label it. So actually having an awareness is quite good. It's about creating balance in life, so making sure that not everything you do is focused on sexual violence, but to have other interests, particularly connection with um, nature and connection with other people with whom you can have a laugh, basically, in a cup of tea. So working based in an area of personal significance is never considered to be all bad. There are many positive outcomes noted by survivors who work with violence and trauma. So Bell's study... Um, of domestic violence counsellors who had experienced domestic violence, she found that 40% of them had some positive gain from the work and the benefits also included things like becoming much more compassionate and grateful and being less judgmental of others, developing a sense of competence in their own coping abilities, maintaining um, the objective for working motivation so it gave them a real thing of, I need to get this job done. And it, they, many of them actually said it led to a resolution of their own personal traumas. So in terms of survivors um, working as volunteers in circles then, as Stephen said this morning, I've got there 800, more than 800, now it's 884, uh, members of the public volunteering for circles in England and Wales. And it's estimated about 20% of the current volunteers are survivors. Um, so I'm going to increase that number now. To, it's about 175 survivors are currently volunteering in England and Wales. I think this is important because it needs to be recognised both in terms of the potential it might have for partial restorative justice, and I'm being very careful about the word partial, and in terms of the training and support needs of all members of the circle. So we've actually begun our little journey, haven't we, Chris? In little small steps, a little backpack and a knotted hanky on a stick. Um, off we go. So our first bits were about testing the temperature to see what, what the views are out there about survivors working for circles. So we ran a, a workshop a couple of years ago for circle facilitators to explore the perspectives that others might have of a survivor volunteering for circles. We weren't asking for the people that were participating in the workshop to give their own views. We just got them to think about it from other people's perspectives. We also conducted a web survey of circle facilitators to ask them their views and practices regarding asking volunteers about their survivor status. So in terms of the workshop, we asked people to consider what do you think the core member might think about having a member of their um, team or circle who is a survivor? What about the circle facilitators? What would their views be? So other circle volunteers, the survivor themselves, or the family and friends of the survivor, what might they think? What we found in doing the analysis was that actually, although these were all different perspectives, and there were a number of different themes, there were a number of generic themes that came up which were important. Really the key one was the fear about there might be a motivational conflict, that the person might be doing it because they want to have revenge or punish sex offenders. They might be going in quite aggressive. 
some people feared that they might be a resource drain and actually just take up too much, they'd be too needy, so using all those conceptions we had right at the very beginning. Some said the other members of the uh, circle might feel the need to constantly protect them and the, uh, their eye would be taken off the core member whilst they focused on the victim. And also this sense of emotional vulnerability. The other key concern really was the fact that they might be easy prey for the um, offender if they were to know who they were and easy to manipulate in, into a situation. And as I'd said earlier, actually, we do know that there's a very, very high risk for re-victimisation of people who have experienced sexual violence. So they might be genuine concerns. However, the potential benefits were also there. There was a real sense that actually the victims themselves would really understand the victim impact and bring us back to the victim focus and understanding the victim's position. They would also understand the processes of grooming much better than anybody else and so they'd be able to identify it earlier so actually in terms of risk assessment they'd be really good on the risk assessment they also said to have come to this point they must be really resilient and actually possibly less shocked by anybody else of anything else that was said they were also coming not to build their CVs they were here long term they were going to be a really dedicated volunteer long term because they had a real commitment to preventing violence it wasn't about some other personal gain that they were doing it so there might be the benefits, and the benefits weren't for the individual, the benefits were for the circle. We then did the web survey of the circle facilitators. We had nine respondents, and we asked whether or not it was their current practice to ask about victimisation. Only three said, yes, they always ask. Two said, yes, said, yes, we are sometimes. And four of the facilitators said, actually, no, we never asked that question. So at the moment, there seems to be inconsistency as to whether or not we're doing this. One of the key things that came out from those who did ask the question, they had developed a way of sensitively asking the question. And I just think that this quote had just said it all nicely, it summed it up. They said, in terms of asking the question, it's obviously a personal thing to ask about, but I do feel as though I have to warn people first and that, that they will be asked. And so it's not an out of the blue question. I always state at the start of the interview that what I'm going to ask them, that I'm going to ask them the question, and I give them the reasons why. So I tell them the reasons why I'm going to ask it. I tell, it, I tell, it, I tell them it so I can give them better supervision and can be mindful about which core member I place them with. But also I can gauge if the survivors are a majority or a minority in the volunteer group. And I'm keen to have that the group should reflect the community at large, so we don't want it biased either way. For example, I would worry if the group was either 100% survivors or 100% not. I also say that, um, that, that should they not want to tell me something now, that that's fine, and that they can give me a different answer at another point in time without prejudice. And I think that was a really important point, because some people then, if they recognise their survivor status, or they've built up enough trust with the circle facilitator and feel able to now say that that's OK, and that's, that they're not jeopardised in any way. So what actually happens when the question's asked? No one actually reported an adverse reaction from anyone that they did ask the question. In fact, a number of positive responses were actually indicated. So such as some people saying, actually, this was the first time they'd ever disclosed to anybody. They reported a sense of relief about being able to say about it openly and it not jeopardising their potential position as a volunteer. So that was very important. Asking the question also didn't uh, result in being flooded with details of the abuse. That seems to be a core fear for lots of people. It's that opening a can of worms, like I don't really want to know what went on. So many disclosures are actually very brief and they only divulge minimal characteristics of the abuse. They're not going to go into great long detail. And as I said, some volunteers will only come to recognise. So we don't often get this effect, which is what everybody's anticipating when you go to ask the question. Where am I going now? So, have I, I haven't got time really. Where am I looking? Have I still got time? A few minutes. I'm not going to show you this video, unfortunately. I was going to show you because I'm running out of time. So, when we look at current practice, in Circles UK at the moment, we don't feel it's appropriate. I'm saying we, I'm not part of it, but we don't feel it's appropriate for the core member to be informed of anyone's survivor status, mainly because of the issues around sort of manipulation and protecting the volunteer. 
So whilst it might be known by a circle facilitator and, or some or all of the other volunteer members, it shouldn't actually become public knowledge. I think there's a real issue with allowing that to become public knowledge. So as I said, survivors have a higher rate of victimisation and we're not just talking from known sex offenders but from other people, so we should actually um, recognise somebody's sort of vulnerability in actually that becoming public. Actually, to allow that to come out would actually risk the um, f functioning of the circle as well as risks to the volunteer. So the study that we're currently do planning to do, and it's just going to ethics next week, we've got four main aims. We want to explore the motivations for and experiences and, of supporting a core member who's been convicted of sexual offences in the community for volunteers who've personally experienced sexual victimisation. We want to ascertain whether victim, uh, volunteering for circles serves as a restorative justice process for survivors, and if so, in what ways? And back to the idea it will be partial. We want to investigate the circle experiences of non-survivor volunteers, the facilitators and the core members, when a survivor volunteer either is or is considered to be likely to be a member of a circle. And we want to identify the issues that might be pertinent to training and support of volunteers and for the effective functioning of a circle and to maximise the restorative potential for all participants. So we're going to go for a qualitative design, uh, employing both semi-structured interviews and an anonymous web survey. And the idea of this will be a triangulation of both data and method. And the idea of using triangulation is the weakness of one method should compensate slightly for the other, and actually by getting the perspectives of all the different people, we'll get a much broader picture. Additionally, by using the interviews, we'll get real depth, and by doing the web survey, we'll get real breadth of information. So bringing that all together should be quite good. Obviously, it's going to ethics. As most people recognise, how many people have been to ethics recently for anything that you've done? Yeah. Do you always, do you always get harassed when it's to do with sexual violence? They just look at me and go, oh, God, it always goes up to always the university level. They look at my stuff and go, no, no, no. Um, I don't think it's that much of a minefield, but everybody else always does, as soon as you mention the word sex, let alone if you mention perpetrator in along with the, the, the victims at the same time. I think it's going to be good fun. So our planned analysis, then, we're going to use directed content analysis, looking for the themes from the literature from altruism born out of suffering, post-traumatic growth, and um, restorative justice, looking at the principles and values. We'll also do a thematic analysis of things we weren't actually looking for to look at unexpected themes that might help in terms of selection and training of, of all the volunteers. And that's where we are, and so we're off on our journey. So thank you very much. <laughs>